Good morning, everyone. For like the 20th time, I must be tired of saying good morning by now, but good morning. Firstly, thank you very much for the opportunity to come and share with you as a congregation. It's an honour and a privilege to be able to stand up here. Um, As you've already heard, my wife Sharon and my daughter Molly, from here originally, but grew up a lot of my younger life in London, so hence the mixed accent. Um, Interesting, something interesting about me, I'm now on my, it's actually my third, but we'll call it my second undergraduate theological degree. I'm one of these guys that seems to like the punishment of studying and writing essays, so I'm still busy doing that. Um, And the other interesting thing about me, myself, is you wouldn't necessarily know to look at me, but I'm almost blind. I have pinhole vision, so I don't see very well at all. So if I stumble during the sermon, please bear with me, and we'll get through it together. Okay, so, 1 Samuel chapter 1. What I'm going to do is I'm going to give this to you as an introduction for a couple of different reasons. One, if you don't think I'm crazy by the end of it, and one day you need cover again, I have a base to start from where we can pick up where I I left off. That's number one. Number two, something I want to show everyone is that the Old Testament often is a very scary place. It's a place we don't necessarily like being because we don't understand it, 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 there's so much in it, and often we tend to neglect the Old Testament. Yet this book here of Samuel is a book that's so relevant to us today. We're in a time in this book now where we've been through the book of, in in, in a chronology, we've been through the book of Judges, sorry, I think I'll keep moving away from this. We've been through the book of Judges, and at the very end it says of Israel that every, there, was, there was no leader, but every man did what was right in his own sight. So nobody was obeying God, everyone was doing what they wanted to do. So we've reached a problem stage for Israel, it's going wrong. In between Judges and the book of 1 Samuel, you get Ruth, and this is happening at roughly the same time, but we're not going to touch Ruth for now, we're going to go straight into Samuel. In this book we're going to see certain themes, as an introduction today, we're going to see certain themes. The first one is everyone was doing what was right in their own sight. The second theme that you're going to see, and my encouragement to you would be that, even if we never meet again until we reach heaven, my encouragement would be this. Pick up the Old Testament, start somewhere like Samuel, and read. Because here we we see this man, David. David is a loved character in the Bible. David's a wonderful man of God. Yet in this book here, we read how David is a misfit. David does at points does everything but what God tells him and requires of him. He'll do everything but. And yet we love this man so much. But here we see his humanity, his frailty. But in all of that, David understood that God was sovereign. God was above all. He understood that clearly. We're going to see in these themes bad parenting. You're going to see David make such a mistake with Bathsheba further on that when his kids commit sexual sin, what can he do? But all we read is, and David was angry. Surely there should have been more than just anger. But because of his sin, he can't do anything against his children. They throw that in his face. We see bad parenting, not just with him, but with this character, Samuel. We see this idea of the outward appearance. Israel wanted a king like all the other nations. So they asked for Saul. King Saul, it says, was a head length, taller than everyone else. Good looking. So they saw what they thought was good looking. It was outward appearance. It wasn't what was going on on the inside. They wanted what looked good to the world. We see this this theme to see and to take. David will take this further. He will see... He will take and with Bathsheba he will lay with. So there's action. There's a consequence at the end. This book directly will address sin. The problem is we live in a world today that doesn't want to address sin. Okay, Me and Sharon were watching a, a programme a while ago, months ago, about, do you remember the horrific case with the two children um, down in Stone with the, the guy Huntley? Now, Ian Huntley, now... People watch TV, we tend to watch TV and say, that's a sinner, not me. Look what he's done, that's a sinner. But we won't necessarily want to address 
what's going on with us. A while ago we had the, the situation with the whole thing we went through, political ideology to side, but what happened with Boris Johnson, when so much happened, it was wrapped up. This man refused to simply say, you know what, I'm wrong, I'm sorry. There was always an excuse, it was someone else's fault. I didn't do it because they did that over there. I had to do this over here. There was never a simple, I'm sorry. So this book's going to deal directly with sin and show us the consequences of that sin. In today's society, it's do what you want to do. As long as it makes you happy, that's fine. Just do it. But my encouragement against you would be don't seek happiness. Seek holiness. Because in seeking holiness, we are sanctified. And sanctification's end result is happiness. Because that happiness is found in Christ Jesus. We see the, we'll see the theme of incest. We'll see this idea again of rape and incest. So all of these themes, what they should encourage us to do is to address not just, but to not only sin, but we must address sin from the pulpit, but it's got to be with encouragement and exhortation. So if you ever sit in a church where someone is preaching nothing but hellfire and brimstone, I would say run, because that's not the gospel message. The gospel message is that Christ overcame the punishment for sin bringing us eternal life that's the encouragement that's what we must always portray to a dying world and that is what we must preach to ourselves on a daily basis I am forgiven of my sin because Paul said in Romans where sin abounds grace abounds all the more that doesn't give us a free ticket to carry on in sin What it does tell us is that when we fall, we slip, we make mistakes, we mess up, we think beyond anything that is redeemable, God is there and God loves us. That love doesn't change, it's unfaltering, (coughs) unwaving, unchanging. So as we pull apart 1 Samuel, verse 1, there was a certain man from Ramathiah, a Zuphite, from the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, son of Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuf, an Ephraimite. So we're told, we're given this information. There are no, there's no name written in the Bible. You'll get genealogies all over the Old Testament, and people tend to steer away from them because it's just a bunch of names, don't understand what they mean, so whatever. However, there is no name that is written in the Bible that doesn't give us background, that doesn't give us reason. So we don't have the time today to go into this whole genealogy, but just to say to you, there are things that you can look at yourself, you can find tools on the internet, Google these things, you'll start to see patterns of names. What we're told, the one bit of information we can take from this, is that he's an Ephraimite. Now, Ephraim was one of the northern tribes. There was ten and a half tribes in the north, and Ephraim was the biggest of them. There are times in the Old Testament when you will hear the northern part. So in the south you have Judah, And half of the tribe of Benjamin. Up north, you hear them sometimes referred to as Ephraim. Simply because they were the biggest tribe up there. So verse 2 goes on to say he had two wives. We can stop there. He's already got problems. You know, you've got two wives. (laughs) We we can stop there. You've now got a huge problem. You know, God never made it to be two. And I understand there are in different cultures, things work different ways. I get that. But biblically, he made one man... For one woman. That is the formula. One for one. But this man has two wives. One called Hannah. And the other named Penina. Now Penina had children. But Hannah had none. Verse 3. Year after year this man went up from his town. To worship and sacrifice to the Lord Almighty. At Shiloh. The place where the presence of God was. This was a yearly, uh, a yearly undertaking. And then the writer drops in two names for us, where Hophni and Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, were priests of the Lord. So what the writer's doing now, in his writing style, we think, I should probably say at the beginning, we think possibly that this first part was written by Samuel himself. We know he couldn't have compiled both books, because by the time book number two comes, Samuel's dead. Other contenders are Nathan, the prophet Gad, But let's say for now we'll hold to that this Samuel is writing this 
himself. So what he's doing as the writer, it's almost like, do you know when you watch a, you watch a TV program and just before the advert, they'll drop something in and then after the advert, you're watching, you think, I've just seen that. The writer's introducing you to someone. So he's introducing these names, Hophni, Phineas and Eli. Whenever the day came Elkanah, for, for Elkanah to sacrifice, he would give portions of meat to his wife Penina and to all her sons and daughters. But to, to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her and the Lord had closed her womb. This name Hannah can translate from the Hebrew as grace or grace of God. And then you've got Penina, which translated roughly... It talks about the face, it talks about outward appearance, one of our themes, this outward appearance. It can also talk of a, a stone like a ruby in the Hebrew, a hard polished stone that looks beautiful on the outside, but it's hard and cold on the inside. Whereas Hannah means God, uh, sorry, grace or grace of God. So he gives a double portion to Hannah because he loves Hannah. He loves grace. He's not so interested in this shiny, hard thing as an outward appearance. Let's call her his trophy wife. She's got the kids, she's got everything. But he loves grace. He loves the grace of God. But because the Lord had closed her womb, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. So once a year, these two women come together with, with um, Elk and they, they, they go up to Shiloh to worship. And Hannah's life is made absolutely miserable by this woman. Ha, look what I've got. You're, in the ancient world, I had to write on this quite extensively at university. In the ancient world, to not have children was seen as a curse. Not on the man, but on the woman. If you didn't have children, you were cursed of God. So you can imagine these two women going up with Elkanah and just the complete and utter dismay of Hannah because she was constantly tormented. Look at you, you're cursed. God wants nothing to do with you. Why are you here? Trying to push her out constantly. The problem that he's got two wives, he's got this problem. This went on year after year. Whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her so that she would not eat. Her husband Elkanah would say to her, this, bit, this is for the guys, I, I love his response here. Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you down, what, downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than ten sons? That's a sh it's a guy response, and I don't think he meant it with malice. But I think as men, what we often fail to do is to listen. The wife, the woman doesn't always want us to fix things. I'm a fixer. Sharon came home to me, it was, I think it was last year, and she had to do a wall display. She's a primary school teacher, so she did this wall display and she, she's got a colleague and the colleague came in and the colleague thought he had a better wall display. So we're going backwards and forwards and Sharon came home and she laid all of this out to me. So in my mind, the first thing I'm thinking is, right, I'll go to the school, I'm going to give him what for, for talking to my wife like that, and then we can do this with the wall display, we can do this and this and this and this. And all she wanted was someone to listen. Not to suggest, am I not better to you than ten wall displays? He didn't, he wasn't listening. He needed to listen. Often, often when it comes to things, the spiritual things, things of the Lord, I find that sometimes it's the woman that's more in tune, that's listening. The man's not necessarily listening. Then we go on into verse 9. It says, Once, once when they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah stood up. What I would really like to know is what goes on between verse 8 and verse 9. 8 says, Husband Elkanah would say to Hannah, Why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than ten sons? Once when they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah stood up. I would like to know what goes in between them. There must have been some sort of discussion. Like, whatever the discussion was. I don't think it was a happy one. Let's put it that way. But it goes on then to say, now Eli the priest, so we're now finding out, we were introduced to Eli a few verses ago, but now we're finding out more about this character Eli. Eli the priest was sitting on his chair by the doorpost of the Lord's house. This word for um, chair can also be translated throne. So he was sitting on his throne at the front of the temple. So what he is, is he's representing God to the people, 
and the people to God. The people would come to him, he would go into the temple and intercede, and he would come back with words from God. So he's the representation of God to the people. Sitting by this doorpost, in her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly, and she made a vow, saying, Lord Almighty, if you will look on your servant's misery and remember me and not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life, and no razor will ever be used on his head. Here in Hannah's weeping and her, her distress and her anguish, we can hear something changes in her. Something completely changes. She begins to realise that everything she wants, everything she has, everything she desires, is for the glory of God. Everything she wants, she has, she desires, is purely and solely for the glory of God. We can break this down to the cross. Every time we come to the cross of Christ and we bow down and we say, God, remember what Christ said in the garden, Father, if it be your will, take this cup from me. Nevertheless, your will be done and not mine. In his submission to the will of the Father, what was achieved at the other end, it was our salvation. So every time we come to the cross, we bow down and we understand that in the shadow of the cross, it's all about the glory of God. Once we grasp that, we become fruitful. We are then able to go into the dying world and to preach a message to the lost that brings glory to God. Now, if your desire is for a Mercedes Benz, and you're, that's what you're asking God for, or I want to be rich, or give me this, or give me that, the heart's desire is not right. Hannah realises I want a son, but she realised the son had to be for the glory of God. Then we go on to verse 12 and it says, As she kept on praying to the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying in her heart and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. Eli thought she was drunk and said to her, How long are you going to stay drunk? Put away your wine. Eli thinks this woman's drunk. Sad state of affairs. This man who is representing God to the people and the people to God. If someone walks through those doors right now, there is a, there is a possibility you could think, okay, they've been drinking, they've been using drugs. But discernment, the Spirit of God should tell you there's more going on here. Whether there is some sort of outside influence or not. In this case, not. She's so in such deep anguish. She's so torn. He can't realise this. Why? Because later on as you go into Samuel, Samuel you'll realise in chapters 2 and 3 he's spiritually dead. There's a deadness. He has no connection with the Lord. His sons are robbing the Lord and he's partaking of that because he thinks, well, as long as they're robbing the Lord and I'm not and I eat of it, I'm okay. He's not. He's partaking of that sin. So then we go on to verses 15 and 16. Not so, my Lord, Hannah replied. I am a woman who is deeply troubled. I have not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I have been praying here out of great anguish and grief. Hannah has to explain to him what, what she is doing. Why she's there. She has to explain to him. Granted he accepts. But it takes a human to tell him. Not God. But the beauty on the other side of this. Is. The pastor approaches her. And she doesn't. Get a godly. Any sort of godly response from him. Yet. This woman doesn't take up. This Remember this went on year after year. So she's come up. This man must have seen her. Time after time, and yet he doesn't know the congregation. She doesn't leave, she doesn't argue with him, she doesn't say, Well, I don't like what Pastor Chris has said, so I'm out the door. She doesn't do that. She accepts it. So many leave, please, I implore, please, don't be like I have done in the past. I don't like what the pastor says, so I get up and I leave. Don't be those people. 
it's fine to disagree on stuff. Now, if the pastor would be doing something, if you go to a congregation and the pastor is doing something openly hostile to the word of God, yes, I would speak to the pastor. If that isn't corrected, yes, I would leave. But to disagree about something that's trivial, you view it this way, I view it that way, it doesn't matter. What matters is that Christ died for us and by his shed blood we are saved. That's what is of importance. In verses 17 and 18, he goes on to bless her. Eli answered, go in peace, and may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked of him. She said, may your servant find favour in your eyes. Then she went her way, and she ate something, and her face was no longer downcast. She accepted the blessing. She knows this man isn't in tune with God. She is. She's crying out to the Lord. But she accepts the blessing. The man who God had put there to administer his word to them, she took that word at face value because she saw past the man. It's not about the man standing there, it's about God. It's about what God is doing, what God wants to do through you, for you. She didn't ask for a confirmation. She didn't go away and pray, Lord, give me a confirmation. Or like Gideon, Lord, lay out the fleeces for me. She believed what was said to her. And I think the lesson for us here can be In Luke chapter 2, it says that the angel Gabriel came to Mary and told her that she would bear this son. She would bear the Messiah. What does it say? It doesn't say that she went and told all her pals and they went and had a good old chin wag about it. It says that she took these things to heart and she pondered them. And I think often there's a wisdom in saying nothing. It doesn't mean that every single time the situation can be said, don't talk, don't say anything. Sometimes we do share, and we need to share. But there are times that we feel that the Lord is showing us, the Spirit of God is showing us something from Scripture, for example. And we keep them, we ponder them. And the beautiful thing is, is when we do that, you know that sometimes, I've had it once before, I read a verse years ago, and it said something very particular to me. I thought, that was interesting, I kept it. Two or three days later, the pastor I was serving under at the time, he came to me, his wife came to me and says, Ramon, I think I have a verse to share with you. I feel the Lord putting this on my heart to give to you. Now, out of 60,000 plus verses, she came and gave me this verse. That had to be the Spirit of God talking. Or there was some real luck going on. And I'm not one that believes in luck. I believe in the providence of God. And she gave me this verse. And you know when you're so shocked, you think, what? where did that come from? We knew where it came from. But you just think, wow, that's the providence of God. As Mary did, she held these things. She didn't just... Because sometimes when we say, I feel the Lord saying, the Lord has told me, we end up with egg in our faces. Because it's not necessarily the Lord. We need to be careful. But this woman takes it at face value. Then it goes on in verse 19. It says, Early the next morning they arose and worshipped before the Lord, and then they went back to their home at Ramah. El- Elkanah knew his wife, Hannah, and the Lord remembered her. So in the course of time, Hannah became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel, Shmoel, or she said, Say, because I asked of the Lord, or God hears. Shmuel in the Hebrew is God hears. So God heard this cry and God gave her what she had asked for. Then we go on and we hear in verse 21. When her husband Elkanah went up with all the family to offer the annual sacrifice to the Lord to fulfill his vow, Hannah did not go. She said to her husband, after the boy is weaned, I will take him and present him before the Lord and he will live there always. The response was, do what seems best. Um, to you. Stay here until you have weaned him, only may the Lord make good his word. So the woman stayed at home and nursed him, nursed her son, sorry, until she had weaned him. After he was weaned, she took the boy with her, young as he was, along with a three-year-old bull, an ephah of flour, a skin of wine, and brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh. When the bull had been sacrificed, they brought the boy to Eli, and she said to him, Pardon me, my Lord, as surely as you live. Now remember, she's going back to this man who clearly isn't in tune with God, but it's the person who had been put in spiritual authority over her. As surely as you live, I am the woman who stood here beside you praying to the Lord. I prayed for this child, and the Lord has granted me what I asked of him. So now I give him to the Lord. For his whole life he will be given over to the Lord. And he, Samuel, worshipped the Lord there. 
So Samuel now is dedicated to the service of the Lord. We see, the, the, we see this result of, cha- of the change in prayer. Hannah now is going to go on to fulfill the vow to the Lord. And this idea again in the, in the original language is that she's going to give him back to the Lord. She's not giving, she's, in the language suggests she's lending. She understands Samuel is her son. God has given her a son. He will always be her son. But she's going to lend him back to the Lord or dedicate him to the service of the Lord for the rest of his life. We read earlier that no raise, she promised no razor would ever touch his head. This was the Nazarite vow, and Samson would take it as well. It was that they would, ne- one was they would never cut their hair, two, they would never drink anything from the vine, and three, they would never touch or interfere with the dead. It's the same vow being made here. So Samson was dedicated to the service of the Lord. But notice this, in good parenting, she didn't ask, please make my son a really important man. Please make my son the first minister of Scotland. Please make him a really, not that anyone wants that position, but, but please don't, please make him a really rich man, a really influential man, that everyone would know his name. Please make him so powerful that everyone has to bow down to him. She simply says that he would be dedicated to the service of the Lord. And that should be our cry for all our children, whether physically you have children or it's the children of the congregation, the children of God. May they be dedicated as they grow to the service of the Lord. For see, in the Lord's economy, To be rich is to be poor on this earth. But to be rich here on this earth, by this world system, doesn't mean you carry favour with God. The Pharisees forgot this. It doesn't mean that you're favoured because you're rich. So he's dedicated to the service of the Lord. May this always, always be our prayer for our children. That they will be dedicated to the Lord. So in closing in an introduction, my question and my encouragement is this to you. Is there something in this moment of time, perhaps there is, perhaps there isn't, but it will come. Are you waiting for something from the Lord? And are you in the right place to receive it? Like Hannah, is the prayer, Lord, let it be for your glory? Or is it, Lord, I want? I had a friend, I have a friend, sorry. He leads a very big church movement in the States, a huge church movement. And I remember sitting with him once, a very humble man, and I asked him, we were talking about ministry and so forth, like, how did you, you know, how did you get into ministry? At the time, the Lord was asking me to give up stuff to go into the ministry. I didn't know if I wanted to do that. I was busy with photography. I was a good photographer. I was earning good money doing it. And he told me a story. He said, you know what, Ramon? He said, sometimes God wants to take something from you just that he knows he's number one because he's bigger and more important than that thing. So, okay. This man grew up in Southern California. So he, he He ate, slept, breathed surfing before school, as you grew, before college, before work, out on the waves. After school, after college, after work, out on the waves. Surfing, that was his life. Everything was surfing. God said to lay down the surfboard and pick up the Bible and teach my word. He didn't want to. He denied it. He pushed it back. He fought against it. Until one day he got on his knees and said, you know what, God? Okay, he laid down the surfboard, picked up the Bible and started teaching. And just like with Solomon... Solomon said, didn't say, make me rich. He said, give me wisdom so I can guide your people. So this guy ends up marrying a woman whose dad started, spearheaded this movement. This movement moves across the world now. He becomes number two within that movement. He's teaching the word, teaching the word to, to thousands, to millions by the time. Because this was going on in the, in the 60s and 70s. By the time we got podcasts and we got you know, radio that would stretch across the oceans. He's teaching to millions a week. One day he gets a phone call 
from a guy in South Africa. Now, if any of you know, South Africa is supposed to be, I would have no idea, but it's supposed to be the surf capital of the world. If you want to surf, South Africa is like the place where all the big wigs go. So he gets a phone call from a guy in South Africa and says, would you like to come down and teach the, lead the conference here in South Africa? And my friend Brian says, yeah, sure. He says, do you like surfing by any chance? Yeah, I love it. He says, well, here's the surf capital. What we'll do for you, you leave the conference and we'll make it a surf holiday for you. Okay, so he goes down. After that, he leaves this conference. This guy says to him, Brian, I'll tell you what. Do you want to come and lead the conference every year and we will make it a surf holiday for you? Yes, yeah, sure, why not? So to this day, 35 years later, he's still going to South Africa every year. Because all God said to him was, put it down. That I know that I'm number one in your life. Like he said to Hannah, this idea of you wanting a child has got to be for my glory. So that's my encouragement to you today, guys. Is there anything the Lord is asking you? Put it down or change your perspective on it. So that I can give you what your heart's desire is. But so that it's for my glory. Amen? Amen. Father, you are good and you are gracious. And yes, Lord, we have to.